We are speaking with Vink Giesman, a serial entrepreneur and creator of the Things Network, which was successfully crowdsourced and kickstarted to the tune of 300,000 euros. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Let's start with discussing net neutrality and what the internet is supposed to look like and how it should function. In essence, it, as it has been functioning thus far in history, no, no corporation, telecom, or government should have the ability to disrupt any user or citizen's access to the internet, nor their ability to exercise their free speech via the internet. Could you tell us what you think the internet should look like? Yeah, so um, uh, the internet uh, should look like an open platform where uh, anybody can contribute uh, to a global uh, a, a network infrastructure and also be able to, to utilize it in a way. Um, the strength of the internet is that we're all connected. Uh, we decided to outsource some centralized tasks to uh, either governments, government organizations, or now mostly privatized telcos. Um, and uh, um, uh, and what you now see uh, see happening is that these uh, centralized forces we've put into place to uh, have an efficient uh, operation now also exercise all kinds of other forces to optimize their own gain. And uh, from a systems theory, you see that you created a system that has a, had a certain objective, and now all of a sudden this system is uh, sh shifting objective and actually uh, having an objective to optimize itself instead of optimize why we created the internet. So there's a very abstract talk about uh, the internet. One of the mechanisms to to make sure that the internet stays open is is that every piece uh, of information is treated equally when equally when we route it. This gives everybody the same chance to put some uh, get some information from A to B. Uh, this net neutrality is being compromised because centralized forces uh, see this as a way to reduce food or costs. Uh, uh, have a large lobbying budget and organizations and are capable of compromising existing laws that then create a system uh, that is uh, the internet is not optimizing for the initial goal is making sure that we exchange information around the world in a very cost effective way to a goal of uh, the uh, central uh, internet routing organizations uh, to reduce their costs. Uh, uh, and and maximize their their profit, um, uh, and that is that is a bit yeah what uh, what the discussion is is about net neutrality and and as a founder of startups for net neutrality, we have a very uh, yeah liberal and um, uh, more yeah, I would let's say free market approach to this is that we say that if you um, allow large operators and large governments to limit the data flows and let uh, actually organizations pay for how their data is treated, then the level playing field of the internet is compromised because existing parties will have ha harder times in, in, in getting an equal chance on this internet. And therefore there will be less innovation, uh, uh, there will be uh, and less economic growth. And taking a step back a bit, um you know, you mentioned that we are under imminent threat, uh, net neutrality and the free and open internet. Um, and to get to look into a bit more detailed, you mentioned these big companies who want to throttle uh, the internet, these some of these monopolies and, and even the government. We've seen various attempts to restrict the internet by, by governments under pretexts of national security from countries including USA, Russia, China, Turkey, and, and so on. Um, we've had the Stop Online Privacy Act or, or SOPA. Uh, and before we get a little bit more into Title II, uh, what are the greatest threats you see to the internet? Like, can you give us a few more specific examples? And if you can mention your position on government or corporate surveillance and, and privacy rights uh, as well. Yeah, so um, uh, there's, a, there's a total different discussion than net neutrality, um, uh, but it's, 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 it's under the same umbrella of an open and free internet. Um, the, the, the ideal internet for me is open infrastructure that anybody can 
add and contribute to and extend, which makes it go organically, creates a distributed system, which creates a very robust internet. Um, uh, and that uh, uh, we secure the data end to end. So if we have open networks, we need end to end encryption because we don't want anybody to uh, to um, to intervene. Um, this is a a strong matter. Uh, it's it's um, um, uh, if you enable end to end encryption, you make sure that the privacy of everybody is um, uh, is uh, is actually taken care for. Um, this also means that um, in threats that you can also not access the data. And emotionally, this is very hard to accept. Um, uh, personally, for me as well, this is, a, this is these are huge dilemmas where you say you want to have a privacy, but then if you want to have privacy, you must also understand that that bad people also have privacy, right? So this um, uh, this is a very very hard discussion. Uh, uh, um, uh, although, if in my opinion, if you do a complete trade off, um, uh, the world will be a more uh, uh, secure and safe place if we make sure that our data is end-to-end uh, uh, -end to create encrypted and secured, and uh, uh, that's possible. Um, what I do think is that this. Um, uh, the, um, the, the, the actual model that we're going to do is that that should lead from a democratic process. And, uh, uh, and on the level, uh, on, the, on the field of, of, um, of surveillance, and um, I, I, like, I do not take a dogmatic st uh, standpoint there because um, it, you, it's hard for somebody like it's hard for for from a principal point of view to decide for somebody to 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 to, to impose that on somebody. So um, uh, I, I I have my principles, but I also feel that there is some kind of area where you should be able to to find your way. The only thing that encryption doesn't allow for it. Um, and and I think that um, that that there there needs to be a constant conversation about this. Uh, the only thing is what you now see in countries is that banning encryption altogether is the other dogmatic standpoint. So there is some some way in between, and there is a reality that encryption is there, and there is no way to stop the bad guys, right? If they want to do this, so. In that sense, it's a non-discussion because we cannot influence it. Like if you want to use it, it's there. It's a tool that has created, right? So uh, we let's um, and um, so so that makes the standpoint of of like saying there 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 cannot be encryption is 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 a very yeah strange standpoint because it probably will only hurt the people that they don't want to get. Because the people that want to use encryption to do bad things will use encryption. So uh, yeah, that is that is uh, that's way um, in this area. So like just to conclude, I think it's very important that that there is a democratic discussion and that we keep talking about this. There is this is not black and white, and the hard thing is that encryption is black and white. So it's it's very it makes it very difficult, and uh, and that um, that if we have politicians debating this. They actually know what they're talking about, which is maybe for now the most important thing. That if we want to have the discussion, the politicians know what they're talking about. So, yeah. And going back to uh, then uh, Title II and net neutrality, uh, the next couple of days, more and more activists are going out to Washington, D.C., um, because the FCC is looking to remove Title II, which is going to prohibit. Um, which prohibited telecoms from throttling or blocking internet access. So once that is gone, we would pretty much be at the entire complete behest of these telecom uh, monopolies, possibly even the government apparatus they're intertwined with. Um, so w what are your thoughts in these uh, few days uh, before September 26th to 27th about um, the FCC's wanting to, the lobbyists trying to remove title to and how could this affect your business and other businesses around the world? 
Yeah. So, so yeah. So, so your first question about like like the the, the process. Uh, we had a similar situation uh, in 2014 in the Netherlands when I uh, founded startups for net neutrality with a few Dutch startups. And um, we, we went on a campaign and, and made sure we had a very clear message is that net neutrality is creating, is opening up, uh, creating open markets, is creating innovation, is creating gro uh, uh, economic growth. And um, actually what we needed to do is like we have the European Parliament, of course, there's like actually 750 people that are able to vote. So we, we, we went a campaign to them. Um, uh, really focusing on this growth on job creation in, in uh, uh, on the net neutrality, and it has way more sites, and there's way more reasons why you want to net neutrality. So, uh, what I hope will happen is that a lot of organizations will try to pick their pick their their stand. What I believe is that if the current majority in the U.S. is Republican, uh, known for for having uh, wanting to have open markets, wanting to have free markets. Um, uh, wanting to have a, a country where you can can create your American dream, then then net neutrality is the tool to make sure that the whole country can do the American dream. So I think I think um, um, they're campaigning in that way. I hope that I hope that that from a reason and rational point of view is the is the best. Um, uh, and um, uh, and and then this is basically what you see is that the lobbying of the, like the activist, call it an activist, is always then a bit responsive because they're not on the same table as the lobbyist. And um, uh, so yeah, as I hope that, that there's going to be a lot of noise. There's going to be a lot of um, uh, 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 also larger organizations joining. Uh, and um, um, yeah, let's hope that that it comes for the best. So your second question, then, then when actually this this net neutrality is removed, then um, then um, uh, what what happens uh, happens next? That is that is pretty hard to predict because it's a, it's quite a fundamental rule. So it will allow a large ISPs and internet operators to change their propositions to, for instance, uh, say to um, um, uh, uh, companies, okay, if you want us to make sure that uh, and they then probably call it quality of service, right? So they will we will give you a quality of service kind of arrangement uh, on on routing your data and um, uh, and um, uh, uh, and that will then include giving priority to your to your service, um, which will then actually be beneficial to the larger organizations, probably Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Netflix. Uh, will give it harder. It will give a harder time to organizations that want to uh, 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 want to build the next YouTube, want to build the net Netflix, want to build the next uh, Facebook. Um, so, so that's from an open market uh, uh, perspective, um, and then also this is um, this is a first step towards limiting anything else. Like, right? so what's what's next? Like, if you if you're able to throttle, are you able to block? Well, what's the difference between throttling and blocking? So it's actually open. It's a foot in the door for something that, for a world we just don't want to go to. Um, this is this is the this is the harder uh, yeah, activist kind of argument, which is which is um, yeah, which is always very um, 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 for somebody who's not into to internet and does not know the in, inner workings of internet. It's hard to grasp. Say, ah, it will never happen. It will never happen. Yeah, you will say right. So, uh, but yeah, yeah, I believe that this this is the first step towards that, and um, and this is actually, uh, yeah, yeah, nothing nothing to mess about. With. And, and to go off just on a bit of a tangent, you mentioned the the big boys in Silicon Valley, uh, Google, Facebook, uh, Amazon. Uh, just real quick, your thoughts. Uh, you've heard of Gab, perhaps the social media Twitter uh, alternative. You've got these small tech startups like Minds and Steemit and, and Gab. They've come under attack recently by these big tech monopolies such as Google and Twitter. YouTube initiated the adpocalypse and demonetization of independent thought. Uh, some people argue that Google, YouTube, and Facebook are private businesses which can act as they please, although there's some research to suggest that they were seed-funded by the Pentagon 
which would be government tax, uh, citizen taxpayer money. Uh, what are your thoughts on these recent cases where big tech companies are using the, their power and their finances to, to censor not only users, but slow down or, or destroy new startup tech companies like Gab, uh, apps, and, and so on? Yeah. Yeah, so so I do not believe in in conspiracies. I, I believe in uh, in in system design and and uh, the concept of a runaway system. Uh, um, uh, essentially, you see in your yeah, I think in the financial system, you create a system. Um, uh, it has a certain objective. Uh, it comes alive, uh, and then um, in a period of time, it tries to optimize for itself. Right? It is is. This is the story of AI, artificial intelligence taking over the world, robots taking over the world. Um, and the concept of runaway systems is real, right? So um, Google and Facebook, they were all created with the best intentions. They were grown with the best intentions. I still believe that, that the founders, they have the best intentions to connect the world, but they also need to, 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 to fund that, to, to, to maintain this, this huge operating entity that needs to go. And then you trying to create all kinds of, to design all kinds of features in that system to make itself sustainable. Um, and then you're gonna create some, some kind of like, it's called a runaway uh, system where actually the system goes into a path the, uh, you never wanted to, to, to go. Um, um, Facebook never wanted to create a, a platform that actually could be used by uh, uh, by people in a political way, uh, giving their users uh, fake information uh, and uh, in, in in like uh, compromising democracy, right? So um, so that I don't I don't really believe in the intentional part, but I do believe in a runaway system, and I do believe in creating such a complex systems that we uh, uh, need to uh review it uh, uh from from time to time and then uh and then yeah have a a, a so-called um uh, a, a, a patch to it and um uh, have our our governance uh actually um uh, tame our capitalistic systems we've created and just go back a bit to net neutrality net neutrality specifically a, 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 a very simple rule to tame capitalism in the internet world. So it's not it's not restoring it. It's not like tearing it like tearing it down. It's like trying to set some boundaries to make capitalism do its work properly. And um, uh, uh, going back to to the, the 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 Silicon Valley talk, I think there what you see is that. Uh, there are systems and their their organizations have grown to a scale where they where they can do the serious harm to to our democracy. Um, so so um, yet again, I I do need not really believe in um, in conspiracies, but I do believe if you stack some kind of objectives and design features in such a way that your system can can do things that can do do harm, and then you need a solid government, another government that's going to remove that kind of stuff, right? And then you need, and then you need a government that might say, you know, "Guys, we're going to split up Google." They already almost did it themselves, right? They are, they're already calling themselves the alphabet, like split up the alphabet, or yeah. So th th this moment is going to uh, is, is 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 probably going to to come one day, one day or another. Sort of like what happened to AT and T that uh, way back in the day. Yeah. Um, and let's talk about your your work. You're very proactive uh, in this sector, and talk about uh, the solutions that you are you are providing. And you know, I think this is something that everybody should be doing: is actually um, providing solutions and not not just talking and, and tweeting. You have the Things Network, which was successfully crowdfunded, um, and it's working to decentralize internet access. Could you tell us about uh, the Things Network? Yeah, so the Things Network started in Amsterdam in 2015. Uh, we came across a, a, an exciting new technology called LoRaWAN, and LoRaWAN allows for sensors to connect to the internet uh, through uh, over the air um, with very cheap base stations. 
that you can compare it to Wi-Fi base stations. And they, um, uh, it's the same thing. It's a box as an antenna, but it has a reach of 10 kilometers and can connect 10,000 sensors. So, um, and this single bus box was in 2015, costing around a thousand dollars. So uh, me and my co-founder Johan uh, Stocking, we, we we saw that technology and we thought, okay, th this is an interesting technology to build an internet for things, right? Uh, and um, we looked at like how the internet was created, and the internet was created by um, uh, all kinds of entities, uh, the military, some companies, some educational institutes. They 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 created an open source, open protocol to make their networks their internal networks work together so they could exchange information so when the internet was created it was actually owned by nobody and it was owned by everybody at the same time so you had this distributed model which could grow organically and we all know what happened next but it was because we kept these rules of net neutrality and of uh, of uh, exchanging data so what we did is we, we, we wanted to do the same. So we asked uh, 10 businesses in Amsterdam that were interested in this, this wireless technology. Why don't you put a base station on the roof of your building? We create open source software. So does all these base stations work together as one mobile network, like, like the, like the AT&Ts and the Sprint like mobile networks. And um, we're just going to launch it and we'll see what happens. And we're opening up the protocols. We're opening up the software. We're opening up the concept in an organization. So we uh, created a, a mobile uh, internet for sensors in Amsterdam in six weeks, open source the code, um, told the story, and that spread um, uh, 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 across the world. And uh, within a few weeks, we already had communities on every continent. And now, um, two years later, we, we have uh, local communities building these networks, uh, communities of businesses that are building these networks together um, uh, building use cases on top of this uh, in, in now already nine, nine, 90 countries and 500 cities. So, um, so yeah, the, the, basically what we did is we just looked at like what the principles of the Internet was and we applied it to the Internet of Things because what we saw is that the Internet of Things was existing um, of, of silos. And, and so like if you buy a Nest thermostat, you buy a device and you buy a hub and you buy a service. But like, if I say like I like this Nest thermostat, but I do not do not like the system of Google because I don't like them or I don't like their interface, I don't have a choice. I cannot buy a Nest thermostat and just say okay, like like the I, I want to use it with another service. And this siloed approach of like complete infrastructure, including solution, that is that it was limiting the Internet of Things and why it's why why it's not growing that fast at the moment opening it up, making everything interoperable and making sure that these networks are open and you can use each other's networks, but you cannot see each other's data because it's end-to-end -end encrypted. That is a recipe for exponential growth and, and, and explosive Internet of Things. So, so that's what we... What we uh, what we're working on, and um, and and uh, yeah, until now it's been been been, been very successful, and uh, uh, and it's it's really um, uh, speaking to the minds of a lot of businesses and users that that say, wow, like like if I place a gateway and my neighbor plays a gateway, then yeah, we have half of the of the town covered, and we just can build our small IT company on the top of this, and that we share the infrastructure, like we do it with the internet. And uh, and then and then the, the interesting thing is that how these open models work and a very good example is Linux. Linux was a joke one year, five years later, they were bigger than Microsoft, right? Is that these these open models they grow exponentially because um, they are built, their robustness is built on redundancy. So we will have more than hundred gateways in uh, Amsterdam at the end of this year. So that will mean that every sensor at least talks to like ten of these gateways. So now all of a sudden you have this like open network where you have maybe not like you, you have like limited trusted relationships because you have this huge redundancy and you have an open network and you have a nice uh, encrypted uh, data layer. It works because the redundancy will make it work. The same with Linux, the redundancy, the, the amount of companies, the amount of contributors to Linux is so huge, it can never fall over. Right. So uh, that's what we're doing and, and trying to 
to to have to create a model that is that is um, that that anybody can access. And for those of us that are not as perhaps technically uh, literate, now this system you're talking about would it work in parallel to the internet? Integrate uh, with yeah. it? Um, would they be able to? say pull the plug on the internet that we're using and that would mean that your system would stop functioning uh could just that little detail could you yeah so maybe it's just a very concrete example so for instance i'm a city and uh i have underground garbage containers and uh too many times uh the the rubbish is ending up outside of the garbage containers because it was full so i want to know when the garbage container is full so i can send um uh, the garbage truck to the underground garbage container to, to fill it, to make sure that my city stays clean. So you need to have a sensor in that underground garbage container. And that sensor needs to detect if the garbage container is almost full. full. The sensor will also have a transceiver. This is this LoRaWAN transceiver, right? LoRaWAN transceiver that is sending the data over the air to a gateway. Uh, this is, has a, a range of 10 kilometers. So if you have this network of all kinds of businesses Placing these gateways, you will have at least uh, a few inside. This this gateway is connected to the real internet, right? And then the data is forwarded for them. So it, we make the internet feel things as an extension of the uh, normal internet. But the bandwidth is so low that anybody um, with a with with a with a more than one megabit internet connection will not even notice that his data is going over their network. So actually, what you can do with your home internet you can extend it to the internet of things there which is also an open network right so in that sense um uh, the robustness of that network the internet of things infrastructure so it's it's about a radio frequency and the wireless layer uh, is is because of so many people will have such a gateway um an interesting example is uh, Safecast from uh, Japan. Uh, after the Fukushima Fukushima disaster, the information about where uh, where it was dangerous with regards to radioactivity and where it was not was was first of all not given by the authorities, and then the wrong information was given, and people were ev evacuated from safe places to actually harmful places, and there was uh, were some big mistakes made. So Safecast decided to have a non-government, uh, non-company, but a, a publicly organized um, uh, a sensor network of radioactivity sensors that can give real-time uh, information of the radioactivity uh, situation in the, in the case of an, um, of, an, uh, of an incident, an event. So this is a very good, info, uh, 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 very good example that the moment that it's, it, there's a huge crisis and there's a lot of at stake and, and, and maybe officials get very scared of what's happening, having an infrastructure that is distributed and decentralized and cannot just be taken down by just pulling the plug from one gateway because you have several and, and they are not owned by the government anyway, so they can't do it at all, is, uh, is there is reason behind this, right? So, um, and um, so there is, there is, there are reasons why it because you want to have a more democratic and more be better open uh, world. Uh, but then, of course, this this is also goes for businesses. If you run a business, you want to have a robust platform. You just don't you don't want that if somebody pulls the plug, then your whole network goes down. So this is also just good system design, right? And and applying this to 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 our to our internet infrastructure and our, our, our information infrastructure we have in the world is, 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 is one of the reasons we want to have a robust network. We don't want to have single point of failures. We don't want to have uh, uh, single points of control. So, um, um, so yeah, that is, the, uh, um, yeah, so going maybe back to your question, uh, like if somebody uh, to like, can somebody pull the plug and then compromise the network? No, that's not possible. So essentially, if you had, looking forward, ideally, if you had a lot of these gateways uh, between many different users around the world and the internet plug uh, was pulled, all of these people that are connected could still continue to communicate with each other and visit each other's uh, websites or, or use each other's networks. 
Yeah. So, so to, to uh, this uh, this this network only supports very small messages mm -hmm. because it's it's only sensor data. Okay. But of course, this is just a start, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you you're gonna come with like there's gonna be uh, four five G. Um, uh, we foresee a future where where we we have um, um, a lot of base station uh, across across the country, uh, devices roaming across these uh, uh, stations. And, and 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 a complete distribution of the wireless world. Uh, now we are having very complex, uh, um, uh, high throughput, uh, large base stations that are being used by the large operators, um, uh, replacing them by so-called uh, pico cell uh, gateways. Um, having a distributed network that is our future vision. The only thing is that now with uh, the Internet of Things, there there is accessible uh, uh, hardware and accessible standard that allow you to do this, but uh, but yeah 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 definitely our our ten year plan is to to disrupt this uh, the entire uh, mobile uh, mobile industry. Um, okay, and are there any final thoughts or, or comments you'd like to leave us with? And perhaps you can also tell us about how we can support your work and, and purchase uh, this device that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So you can go to the thingsnetwork.org. You can uh, uh, see where the network is. You can uh, explore what, what what it can bring you. So what kind of applications can you build to 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 enhance your business, to optimize your your processes, to to increase your profit, or to make your neighborhood a more healthy and secure place, or to to uh, to um, to make your, uh, uh, the world a, a better place. Uh, you can place. Uh, uh, you can. Find out there where you can buy gateways. They, they are, you can find them anywhere, uh, and um, uh, and how to to contribute. Um, uh, and if you want to do this with a gathering, because you have a nice project and you want to do with your city, you can also start a uh, a community in your city uh, or join one uh, one of the five hundred already there. So um, um, yeah, so that is. Um, that is that, and, um, uh, and with regards to the net neutrality, uh, I'm supporting uh, uh, the world for net neutrality uh, dot com, uh, and um, uh, this is an organization that is uh, is trying to let a, a voice hear from outside of the U.S. Uh, that uh, that we feel it's relevant that uh, the net neutrality stay, stays in the U.S. Great, and uh, um, you know we need more people like you. Uh, the, the support you got on, on Kickstarter and the crowdsourcing uh, shows you're doing great work. Uh, thanks again uh, for your time. We hope people take notice of what's happening with net neutrality, sign the petitions, uh, and try to stop the, the removal of, of, of Title II. Thanks, okay. thanks, thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the interview.